It is my signal honor and pleasure to be able to welcome to INSEAD Minister Lim Sui Se, a minister in the Prime Minister's office and Secretary General of the National Trade Unions Congress. It's particularly a pleasure to have a representative of the Singapore government here on the occasion of our 50th um, anniversary. Uh, but we're going to talk a little bit about something a little different. We're not going to talk about INSEAD, uh, but we're going to talk about Singapore instead. It's been interesting to us. We've had a series of conversations over co of the course of the day um, about different aspects of the relationship between business and government. Uh, we've talked about how the regulator has been working uh, to either change the nature of the regulator's relationship with business or, um, or changing the role in the last session that we talked about that the government was going to play in business. But what we haven't had a conversation about yet is about what do governments do to make nation states better places in which to live, work, compete. Singapore has, for the last God knows how many years, been consistently ranked as one of the best places to do business. And one of the aspects that has made it such a good place to do business is arguably the set of relationships which are enjoyed between government, labor, and business. It's a word that is used in Singapore quite often called tripartism. And in the course of his political career, Mr. Lim Sui Se has been very much at the front of that tripartism. So before we get started, I, I wanted to invite Mr. Lim to say a little bit about what is tripartism from the Singaporean context? Why is this unique? What makes it special? How, how, how do we understand it? Um, uh, please, Minister. Uh, well, thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Narian and uh, friends. Uh, first of all, uh, congratulations to INSEAD on your 50th you. uh, anniversary. Uh, I've been to INSEAD, this campus, I think this is my third visit. Uh, each visit gets better and better. And uh, today I'm really very honoured uh, to have a chance to have uh, this dialogue with this uh, distinguished uh, gathering. Now, uh, tripartism. Uh, tripartism in Singapore is something that uh, we take uh, very seriously uh, because we believe that uh, tripartism in fact, is one of the uh, few uh, unique advantages of Singapore. Uh, but instead of uh, telling you about tripartism in theory, uh, I thought I would share with you what happened, uh, what did tripartism, uh, how did tripartism make a difference uh, to the Singaporean economy, to the Singaporean workers during this uh, global recession. When the crisis started uh, uh, late last year, it was very obvious to Singapore that uh, firstly, the Singapore economy will be very badly hit because we are a small economy, open, uh, we are export-oriented, so we survive based on the global market. So when the global crisis hit us, we knew firstly it's going to be very bad. Uh, secondly, uh, we also knew that the employment market, the job market, uh, will be of great concern uh, to the workers of Singapore. At a point in time, the International Labour Organization uh, did uh, three forecasts in terms of the employment outlook for 2009 because the situation was so uncertain that, that they could not come up with just one, so they came up with three. They said that the most optimistic scenario is that the world may lose about 25 million jobs. And the most pessimistic scenario was 51 million. And the most realistic scenario was 35 million. Now, as far as the Singaporean workers are concerned, whether it's 25 million or 35 million or 51 million, there are just too many millions to handle. <laughs> and uh, basically, uh, we decided in Singapore that uh, we have to do something different from the rest of the world. So the Singapore government, the National Trade Union Congress, as well as the Singapore National Employer Federation, the three tripartite partners, we came together, and it was in November last year. And we decided, we decided, we decided that we would handle the downturn differently from the rest of the world. And our position was this, was that the rest of the world are all going to cut jobs to save costs in USA, in Europe, in Asia, all over the world. They're all going to cut jobs to save costs. But in Singapore, as tripartite partners, 
we make that collective commitment to each other that we're going to do it the other way around. We are going to cut costs to save jobs in Singapore. So we set ourselves for three targets. Firstly, we must minimize the level of retrenchment in Singapore, save jobs. And secondly, knowing that uh, no matter how hard we try, we can never save, save every job. So there will be workers who will be affected by uh, retren retrenchment. And then the second line of defense is we must make sure that not every retrenched worker will end up being an unemployed worker. So in other words, if you lose your jobs, I must do whatever I can to retrain you, to bring you back to, the, back to employment again. And thirdly, as we go through a downturn, on the one hand, we'll save jobs, but yet at the same time, knowing that saving jobs means a lot of excess manpower in the economy, in the companies, in the industries. We have to make use of the downturn to upgrade the skills, the capabilities of these workers. So these were the three targets set during the downturn. Cut costs to save jobs, uh, minimize the unemployment, and lastly, get ready for the upturn. Today, uh, almost a year later, we're happy to say that firstly, in the areas of retrenchment, retrenchment started in the first quarter of this year, and once the program came to play, uh, by the second quarter, we saw a sharp drop in retrenchment by 70%. And by the third quarter, fourth quarter, in fact, uh, this year, we're likely to see a fairly uh, low level of retrenchment for the whole year. So we achieved that target. Unemployment. Globally, uh, ILO turned out to be wrong because their most pessimistic uh, forecast was 51 million job losses. But as it turned out, by the end of this year, the world is expected to see 59 million, not 51 million. So even the most pessimistic forecast by LO uh, in November last year turned out to be not pessimistic enough. Yeah. So we're going to see 59 million. Global unemployment is expected to reach 7.4%. In USA, it's now 9.8%. In Europe, 8.9%. OECD countries, 30 member countries, 8.5%. But in Singapore, notwithstanding that our economy was so export-oriented, Unemployment went up from 2.5% end of last year to 3.3% first quarter of this year to 3.3% second quarter of this year. And uh, just uh, recently, the third quarter result came out 3.4%. So today, we still enjoy one of the lowest unemployment rates in the world. More importantly, workers during this downturn were being retrained because the government not only came up a program to save jobs, but at the same time, we provided a program to encourage employers to retrain their workers. So for example, any company that send their workers for retraining, 90% of the cost of training, both in terms of training fees as well as the absentee payroll, are funded by the government. And the total package costs the government about uh, more than $5 billion. So in conclusion, I would say this, that tripartism in Singapore is unique because at the end of the day, we look at two angles, basically. Firstly, tripartism in Singapore must be pro-business. Let me make it very clear. Tripartism in Singapore must be pro-business. Because if we are not pro-business, then we cannot be one of the most uh, attractive places on earth to do business. Then there'll be no investment, there'll be no job, then workers can't have a good employment. So tripartism in Singapore must be pro-business. But yet at the same time, Tripartism in Singapore must recognize that Singapore is not just an economy. Singapore is a nation. So in other words, as we continue to be as pro-business as we can, tripartism in Singapore must also be pro-worker. Be pro-worker. And the two, being pro-business and pro-workers, are two sides of the same coin. And that coin is the coin of nation building. So what we're trying to do here is to build a nation, a small nation but a very important nation for the Singaporeans. So we're doing everything we can right, to make sure we are pro-business, to grow our economy, to create jobs, and at the same time, pro-worker, to, en to ensure that Singaporeans have good job, good pay, able to live a good life. So therefore, in, in GIS, I think that's what's unique about tripartisan in Singapore. We work together, we are pro-business, we are pro-worker, and as a result, as a result, we are able to get through a downturn with minimum pain to businesses, to the workers, and yet at the same time, when the up upturn is back, hopefully we are among the first to be off the block. 
because we have been investing in the upgrading of capability during the downturn. Mr. That sounds absolutely magnificent. I mean, you know, you have employment rates which economies would kill for, 3.3%, 3.4%. So would it be fair to ask exactly what did you do? Did you provide incentives to employers? Did you make them an offer they couldn't refuse? I don't know. What, how, how did this work? Yeah, uh, okay, basically what we did was this, was that the, we knew, we knew that with the global downturn, many businesses are going to have assessment power mm. because when your demand drops, obviously, yep. uh, workload will drop. So, for example, one factory in Singapore, it's a Japanese company. Uh, they've been in Singapore for more than 30 years. Uh, the production utilization dropped from 100% to 15%. To 15%. So, when this happened in January this year, uh, the company was in serious trouble because uh, with a 15% loading, they have 85% spare capacity. So, the management received instruction from the Japanese headquarters that you have to retrench <coughs> at least 30% of your workers, 30%. And this company is unionized, so they talk to the union. They say, look, we receive instruction. We need to let go 30% of the worker. So we're talking to them to see how, how best to, to phase out the retrenchment as much as we can. And that was in January. And fortunately, that was a time when the government decided to subsidize wages up to 12% of the payroll. So in other words, what the government was telling the companies was that if you have up to 12% assessment power, instead of retrenching them, the government would subsidize the wages. You keep them. You keep them. Why do we want companies to keep their workers? Because we believe. We believe that as Singapore economy more and more so become a knowledge-based economy, the workers will become more knowledge workers, higher skilled workers. So if we actually force the companies, not force, I mean, if the circumstances mm. forces the company to let go the workers, later on when the upturn is back, they will have a hard time mm. recruiting workers, retraining workers. So we think that it's important to try to preserve the capability in our economy, mm. to minimise the damages done to the structure of the economy. So we told the company, say, OK, now with this a jobs credit, you can now hopefully minimise the retrenchment. The company said, look, uh, at 15% loading, uh, I've no idea when, how long it will take for me to actually, for the market to come back. So I can hold on to workers for six months, I can hold on to workers for one year, but beyond that, it's going to be very difficult. So they were still very reluctant to, to hold on to the assessment power. And then there's where the second program came in. So we said, look, we know you hold the workers, the assess workers, then why don't you send them for retraining under a program called SPUR? And the combination of job credit and SPUR we managed to convince this company, and what he did, this company decided that instead of retrenching 30% of workers, they retrench only 10%. So they have a 20% uh, uh, this assessment power they kept. And what, we, what they did was, in the, in, within the company, they identified the best 20% of their workers. The best 20%. Not the assess workers, mm. but the best workers they can find within the company. They send this 20% of their workers to go for retraining. And as a result, when the, when the business came back, this company of obviously was surprised with the speed of the recovery. But more importantly, having retrained the best 20% of their workers, the company today is able to grow again. And what this company is doing now is that they are repositioning their production plant in Singapore because the product that they produce before the economic downturn won't work anymore. Mm. Because after the downturn, now they have uh, other competitors coming up. Right? Because what we, in Singapore, what we say is that the, uh, there are competitors huh, who are better than us in this world. We compete against them by being cheaper than them. Mm. Right? So if you're better than me, I try to be cheaper than you. Mm. Then we have competitors who are cheaper than us, mm. then we try to be better than them. Mm. So we try to be cheaper than better, better than cheaper. That's how we create a space <laughs> for ourselves. All right? And I think that, that, works, that works very well up to now. But as the result of this downturn, the world has changed. The better competitors are becoming cheaper. The cheaper competitors are becoming better. So the only way for us to continue to survive and grow is to become cheaper, better, and faster. So in Singapore, if you hear this term called CBF economy, that's what we meant. A cheaper, a better, a faster economy. 
To be cheaper means to be more productive. To be better means to be more capable. To be faster means to be more adaptable. And that's what this company did. So during the downturn, they upskill the workers, they reskill the workers, they multi-skill the workers. So as a result, we are not able to run hopefully as a CBF, uh, a CBF economy. So I would say that, that I think on the whole, uh, this is the kind of uh, situation happening. Excellent, excellent. And um, would it be fair to ask, was there a point of view, did the government take a point of view and look, we can keep up something like this jobs credit for so long, Beyond that, I mean, we're, we're just going to run out of money to be able to you know, yeah. uh, keep this going. It's a very good point. Uh, the, when, when this thing happened, uh, so uh, this year uh, I was in Geneva for the International Labour Congress. I met up with union leaders for around the world, uh, from US, Europe, Asia. Uh, so we we're exchanging notes regarding what happened in Singapore. So I shared with them uh, how we managed to cut costs, save jobs, and so on. Uh, they were very envious. And, and one question asked was this, was that the... Where, where did the money come from? Did your government uh, have to take a big loan and then be burdened with this uh, huge uh, interest and so on? We said no. Uh, what happened was that over the last uh, many years, uh, the Singapore government has been saving our, our, our surplus. So today, uh, don't ask me how much is our national reserve uh, because uh, we, don't, we don't disclose them. Uh, but let me put it quite frankly, uh, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. Now, so... <laughs> yeah. So when the uh, and, and, and the reason why we say it's a lot and we say so, I mean, uh, because you see in many countries, uh, they have other form of reserve. Yeah, in some countries they have oil as a reserve. In some countries you have, I don't know, you have a lot of water, a lot of energy, a lot of people, a lot of resources. Uh, but in Singapore we have nothing. We have no sand, we have no water, we have no, no natural resources. So the only thing we have basically is our human resources and the reserve that we have. And so during this downturn, basically what the government did was the first time in the history of Singapore, uh, we actually dip into a past reserve. It has never happened before. Uh, for the last uh, 30, 40 years, uh, we've always lived within our, our means. And by this time around, we say, look, the crisis is just way too big. The worst uh, global recession in 60 years. So as a result, the government made exception uh, to so-called the prime minister. You his the first key to open the safe, uh, to tap on the <laughs> national reserve. But the, for him to do so, he needed the concurrence of the president, the president who is a non-partisan elected by the people of Singapore. So he holds a second key. So the prime minister and the president, having in consultation, decided that yes, we'll make the exception. So both of them used the key of unlock the safe and we draw, up the, draw down this money, the $4.5 billion, to fund the, uh, the jobs, uh, jobs credit. Now, at that point in time, uh, we were quite mindful that the, firstly, we have no idea idea how long this downturn will last. Uh, secondly, is that the, we're very clear in our mind that the, this uh, wage subsidy mm. cannot be a long-term program. Mm. That's at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we must bite the bullets. The only way for Singapore to grow again is not by subsidizing wages to, for companies to hold to excess manpower. That can at best be a short-term solution. The real long-term solution, sustainable solution, is for us to upgrade our productivity, our capability, our adaptability. And there's a reason why during this downturn we have two programs. One to subsidize wages up to the two or twelve percent, but at the same time, there's a program to pay for the training upgrading. Yeah. And as it turned out, as it turned out, uh, the one year program uh, works very well. Uh, and then of course the uh, businesses uh, then ask the government that the uh, yes, uh, we thank you very much for the jobs credit. Uh, yes, we are grateful that the, the economy is uh, moving again. However, mm. however, the recovery is uh, very uncertain and very uneven. You know, the W, you know, uncertain, uneven. So government, can you not pull the plug uh, suddenly? Can you do a soft landing? And I think Prime Minister listened to their view. The union gave a feedback. So finally, we decided to uh, scale down the program over the next six months. So 12% will drop to 9% to 6% and eventually it will be, it will be phased out. So, so in other words, uh, yeah, the businesses are fully aware, the unions, we are fully aware that the wage subsidy is only a short-term measures and that, that we cannot rely on this scheme for the long term. So the only way to move ahead is still to be cheaper, better and faster. Great. Thank you for that, Minister. Uh, before we move on to the next posture, I want to talk about some of the future and how tripartism will evolve. But before that, I thought 
you know, let's have a change of pace and maybe open it up to questions for uh, the minister. It's not very often that we have on stage uh, someone who was managing director of the Economic Development Board, chief executive of the National Computer Board, and also head of uh, all the unions in Singapore. So uh, it's an interesting personality and questions from the audience on tripartism or anything else. There's a question over here, Matt. Minister, thank you very much because you solved one problem of mine. I try to explain people in Switzerland, I live in Geneva, why are we not the Singapore of Europe? Mm. And you explained it very well. We should have had a program with a CBF. <laughs> very good. Um, my question is, and I saw this morning coming in on the metro, that apparently Singapore is considering to write a, strat a strategic paper, what should be the identity over the next five, six years? Mm. Can you elaborate a little bit? Because somewhat you were relating here to cost cutting, adapting to an economic downturn. But to what extent would that opportunity also be something that um, would give the young people a new form of an identity? As a last comment, I remember having read last year that some of the young people like to fly to Korea because there we have economic growth plus culture. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you said you saw something at the... Uh, this morning on the um, Metro TV came a message. The Singapore government is considering to evaluate a paper, a new identity, a new refocused strategic identity. For Singapore. For Singapore. Okay. And the my, Singapore uh, economy? Or? Singapore as a nation? Did you Singapore as a nation. Oh, okay. and, and that related the question, mm -hmm. to what extent can that include cultural identities for the younger generation? Yeah, yeah. okay. The... Uh, I think if you look at the uh, development of Singapore over the years, uh, in the early years of the development, uh, we were very much concerned with our survival uh, in terms of making sure that the, the economy will grow, there's enough jobs uh, uh, to, to, uh, to enable to enhance the quality of life in Singapore. Uh, I think if you look at Singapore today, uh, on the one hand, uh, we are very much a first world country uh, in terms of education, healthcare, economic development, public transport, standard of living, quality of life. Uh, and yet at the same time, I think uh, in Singapore, somehow, somehow uh, we always feel that uh, uh, it's like the best is yet to come. Mm. Uh, the best is yet to come because uh, as a small country, uh, we, we have this sense of insecurity that uh, if we allow something to go wrong, uh, then it can go very wrong. And when something starts to go wrong, it's going to be very difficult for us to put ourselves back on the right track again. So therefore, in Singapore, we tended to try to look ahead all the time, try to be more, uh, to be proactive. So in other words, we believe that the best way to make sure that things do not go wrong is try to uh, do the right things uh, all the time, in fact, even before uh, it is necessary. So one example is this, is that the Singapore economy. The Singapore economy is still doing well. Uh, I think it's recovering uh, quite nicely. Uh, but yet, uh, we do not feel comfortable. We don't feel comfortable because uh, we look ahead the next five to ten years, we ask ourselves, what is happening to the global economy? Uh, we believe that there's some uh, global shift uh, is taking place. It's already taking place. We believe that the, in the next, uh, uh, in the future, uh, there is a global downside. And this uh, global downside is caused by the global unemployment. Uh, earlier I mentioned about 7.4% global unemployment. Uh, that is way too high. And I think this is going to affect the mindset of many countries in how they look, how they compete for, for, for businesses, investment, and so on. So there's a downside. So in other words, globalization uh, over the next three to five years is likely, likely to take a different tone compared to what, what has happened up to now uh, because of this high global unemployment. And there's a downside. Uh, on the upside, uh, there are at least two areas we think are to the advantage of an economy in Singapore. Uh, it may not be to the advantage, <laughs> but it's to the advantage of Singapore. One is a structural shift towards Asia. We believe that the, the globalization of the, uh, the next five to 10 years, there is a structural shift towards Asia. And secondly, uh, the, whole, the pace of urbanization is going to get faster and faster in places like China and India. And thereby present two very important opportunities for Singapore. Uh, firstly, we are in competitive uh, economy in Asia. So with the structural shift to Asia, we think that 
benefit Singapore. Secondly, urbanization. Singapore is an urban city. Mm. All right? We don't have countryside. We are a small little island. It's an urban city. Many problems that these urban cities in other countries are going to face for the next 5, 10, 20 years. We already face them in Singapore in the last 5, 10, 20 years. So in other words, many of the solutions that we have in Singapore can actually be multiplied, be exported uh, to the rest of the world. One example is water. Water. Uh, uh, here you drink uh, Evian uh, from uh, Europe. <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in Singapore, like in Singapore uh, uh, water is a very scarce uh, resource. Uh, we have a big popular dens density, but we don't have enough land. Yeah, so we don't have enough catchment area to, to store the water. So what do we do? Yeah, so basically, for many years, uh, we import water from Malaysia. So some water are produced locally, some imported from Malaysia. We have two water agreements. One will run up by the year 2011, second one 2061. So by 2011, we have to become more self-sufficient. Come 2061, we have to become completely self-sufficient. Mm. And the Singapore government, as I mentioned earlier, we feel very insecure. Yeah. Even though 2061 is still 52 years away mm. from now, already we feel the need, the desire uh, to find a solution. Because we don't want our children, our grandchildren, to be caught in a situation whereby they run out of water. So what we did, we asked ourselves, for every drop of water we are able to produce in Singapore today, if we need to produce three more drops, so from one to get to four, right, one to four, how to get there? Everybody will say, very easy, one plus three equal to four. <laughs> yeah, that, that is a very simple mathematics. So where does a plus three come from? You can collect more rainwater, or you can go to the sea desalination. So that's one way. But I said that desalination is expensive, it's energy intensive, it's not environmentally friendly. So we say, look, can we do something else? So in Singapore, we go back to the basic mathematics. We say one plus three equal to four. But there's another way. One plus one, bracket, multiplied by two, also equals to four. Yeah. So what it means? What it means is that instead of trying to create three more drops of water for every drop of water we have today from the sea, all we need to do is to create one more drop. And then we make use of every drop of water in Singapore twice. First time, by the human being. Second time, by the air conditioning system, by the wafer fabrication plant, by the non-portable use. Right? So non-portable use. And that's how we did. So today, if you go around the world today, there's only one city in the world today that has put in place the infrastructure for one plus one, plus one times two. And that place is Singapore. There's no other city in this world that had a system in place. Every drop of wastewater, every drop of used water after human consumption is being collected with a 100% collection system in Singapore. And every drop of this water having collected, we pre-process them and then we send them through reverse osmosis, ultraviolet, and the second drop will turn out to be even purer than this first drop. So, and we call this our water the new water. Yeah, because we give the water a new, new lease of life. So new water in Singapore today is cleaner than the drinking water because why? It's as clean as distilled water, having gone through a process of re re uh, reverse osmosis and the ultraviolet and so on. Now, so the point here really is this, is that the, we believe, huh? we believe that firstly, I think Singapore will continue to strengthen our national uh, identity uh, in the sense of from the economic development to the social development, to the environmental management. We want to uh, uh, show the world that, the, yes, uh, we may have uh, many natural disadvantages against us because we are just too small. Yeah, we are just too small, we are just too dense. But yet, we believe that the, if we can somehow uh, uh, apply our mind, make use of the best technology from the world, then innovate the solution according to our desire, the requirement, then find the market for our innovation. In fact, we can more than survive. We can more than survive. So it's not just in the way that we run our economy, we run it the Singapore way. We run the Singapore society, our Singapore way as well. Uh, you come to Singapore, we are a multiracial society. We're Chinese, Malay, Indian, uh, 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 and what call the Eurasians and other races. Uh, it's a multiracial society. But if you come to a housing estate, uh, in Singapore, we don't allow the Chinese to live with the Chinese alone. 
we don't allow the Malay to live with the Malay alone. We don't allow the Indians to live among the Indians alone. Because that is a sheer way of having social divides. Yeah. So for many years, we have this uh, so-called ethnic integration policy. So in every community, there must be a combination of Chinese, English, I mean Chinese, Malay, Tamil, and so on. Yeah. So that's how we run our, our society. Uh, the way we run our environment is the same. So I would say that on the whole, uh, you see that, that this is a Singapore identity. I think our uniquely Singapore way of life uh, hopefully continue to gather from strength to strength. Uh, but Singapore is always a, a work in process. Mm. Yeah, our leaders always remind everybody that they never be satisfied with Singapore of today. Now, Singapore of today did not happen by chance. We did not have new water by chance. Yeah, no, we make it happen. We did not have a, a Singapore economy today by chance. We did not have a 3.4% unemployment rate in a global recession by chance. All these are through conscious effort that we make it happen. Yeah, and the only way we can continue to create a future that we want is for us to keep creating that future and not hoping for something to happen to us. Nothing should happen to us. Yeah, anything that we want, we have to make it happen. Yeah, so I think from time to time, you see us talking about the remaking the Singapore economy, remaking the Singapore society, remaking the Singapore environment. Yeah, but basically, that's what we're trying to do, uh, to be uh, using what we call Singlish, uh, our Singapore English, uh, to be better and better all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Were there any other questions on the subject of tripartism? Okay. There's one over there at the back. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Bernadette Reyes, and I'm a TV correspondent from the Philippines. It seems to me that the uh, formula of cheaper, faster, and better is working for Singapore because lots of Filipinos, as you might have known, are going to Singapore to seek for employment. My question is, as you try to strike an optimum balance between the union, government, and business in the Singapore, um, how do you try to strike an internal balance and at the same time strike an internal external balance with that of a fellow ASEAN country? Because as much as we want to contribute to, that, to the progress or to the moving forward of Singapore, we would also like to protect the Filipinos from moving out of the Philippines and, you know, try to at least put a hiatus to the brain drain that's happening, that, that, that is happening in our country. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're he, attracting too many people from around the region into Singapore, Minister. Oh, is, that what you're, is that your point? <laughs> that there are too many Filipi uh, Filipino working in Singapore. Yes, and basically those are, white, those are white collar jobs. So we are losing a lot in They're the Philippines. Losing the but brain. of course, I'm sure the government of the, the Philippines is also thankful because you're also providing employment for our overseas Filipino workers. Yes. Okay. I think that's a very, very interesting point. Uh, uh, in Singapore, we, we, uh, tripartism uh, is working well uh, because uh, our mindset is what we call a win-win-win mindset rather than a lose-lose-lose mindset. Uh, we think that's very important because uh, once we start thinking about win-lose, uh, then the partnership cannot be sustained. Now, uh, in the case of the uh, foreign manpower, uh, if you do ask Singaporeans, uh, Singapore will say that, look, tripartite tra partners, why do you let in so many foreign manpower to come to Singapore? Why do you let our friends from Philippines, from China, from Malaysia, you know, it would be nice if you stop them from coming in, mm. then all the jobs here will be for me to decide to choose, you know, uh, which, one, which jobs to do. Yeah. So why, why do they say that? Because they're thinking win-lose. Yeah. They look at foreign manpower coming to Singapore, it's competing with the Singapore manpower. I think we lose. Uh, so uh, likewise, as you say, maybe from uh, uh, from uh, Philippines' point of view, having the uh, Philippine workers talent come and work in Singapore again, it's win lose, win for Singapore, lose for Philippines. Uh, maybe maybe let me present another way of looking at this. Is that the if you look at ASEAN, ASEAN the ten member countries of ASEAN, today we all face a common challenge. And the common challenge is this, is that if you look at East Asia, North Asia is, I haven't looked at the number, but as a, as a gauge, as a guess, I think 80% of the Asian economy today, at least 80% of the Asian economy today is in North Asia, not in Southeast Asia. 
uh, the Japan, the China, the Korea, and all that. I think they account for at least 80% of the East Asia economy. Yeah. In ASEAN, uh, with let's say 20% of the East Asian share, I think the challenge posed that we ask ourselves is, how are we going to remain relevant to the development of East Asia? Yeah. So in the case of Singapore, we have been a champion, a champion for ASEAN integration, because we believe that if Singapore tries to survive on our own, uh, we are not going to go too far. We are just too small. So Singapore has been promoting, uh, 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 pushing for this uh, ASEAN uh, integration because we want to see ASEAN uh, doing well. Yeah. So therefore, uh, I can assure you that the, while we adopt an open, open door policy for foreign manpower, but at the end of the day, what we really like to see, hope to see, is for the ASEAN economy to all to do well. Will Philippine economy uh, do well enough to attract the Filipino talent in Singapore to go back to the Philippines and even attract other manpower from other countries to go back to the Philippines? Speaking of section of NTUC, I say, look, it's up to, it's for the leadership of Philippines uh, to make that happen. Just like in Singapore, we don't depend on other countries, hoping for other countries to do something to enable us to grow. No, we live in the real world. And the real world tells us that nobody owns us a living. All right, so we are going to go all out to make sure that Singapore economy is competitive. We're going to create as many jobs as we can. And if we cannot produce enough talent in Singapore to meet those demands, we're going to open our door for foreign talents from around the world. Yeah. But we believe that over time, this talent development in Singapore will benefit ASEAN because it's better better that the, the, the talent, wherever they are, are put to good use. The truth of the matter is this, is that talent, talent are global. No country can try to build a wall and stop the talented people from leaving the country. Same thing applied to Singapore. As a section of NTUC, I know very well, there's no way I can try to build a wall to stop foreign manpower to come to Singapore so that Singaporeans can have all the jobs being reserved for them. If we do that, the Singapore economy will go down the drain. You will be cheaper, better, faster. Huh? You'll be more, more expensive, you'll be slower, you'll be lousier. No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll be the opposite. Yeah. So therefore, we recognise that, look, it has to adopt an open-door policy. But yes, at the same time, we also recognise that if Singapore economy does not become cheaper, better and faster, we will stop growing. When we, our economy stops growing, what will happen to all the talented Singaporeans? They are not going to hang around. They will leave. They will go to Philippines. They will go to other places to work. So I would say that at the end of the day, we are all going to be better off if we all focus on economic development. So within ASEAN, let us work individually as individual economy. At the same time, let us work together as an ASEAN integration so that hopefully ASEAN will always have an important place to play in the East Asian economy. Yeah. Many of the conversations we have over the course of the day when people come to visit Singapore is that is that things are very carefully engineered. And, and it's possible that one of the way, one of the reasons why we've had success with this engineering is because after all, so far, we've, we, this has been the first generation that has seen the development from third world to first. Mm -hmm. Increasingly what you're seeing is a generation of people who have only seen the first world. Mm -hmm. What happens when the demands they start making uh, on health care, on education, on opportunities, start going counter to uh, you know, the wonderful ways in which you know, tripartism, other things have been engineered in the past. Do you envisage that happening? Is that, is that a scenario you consider? And if so, how do you prepare for it? Mm -hmm. uh, it it's a very important point that the, imagine, imagine that the tripartism in Singapore mm. is only able to reach out to the older workers uh, the lower educated workers and only to Singaporean workers. Yeah. So in other words, the younger workers, the better educated workers, the professional, the PMAT, the uh, foreign workers, that we exclude them from tripartism. Then over time, over time as Singapore becomes a knowledge-based economy, innovation-driven economy, over time tripartism will become less and less relevant to the mainstream of the Singapore economy. So we are very mindful of that. <coughs> We look at the uh, tripartism of the world. Uh, in, uh, in the uh, uh, Scandinavian countries, uh, in Scandinavian countries, 
tripartism function quite differently. Uh, for example, there's a labour movement for the gold-collar workers, mm. the professionals. There's a labour movement for the blue-collar workers. And there's one for the white-collar workers. So if you go to the Scandinavian country, whether it's Sweden or Norway, there are three national centres. Yeah, but not in Singapore. In Singapore, we only have one national centre, and there's a National Trade Union Congress. And, and, and the NTUC, we are the labour movement, not just for the blue-collar workers, the white-collar workers, we also the labour movement for the gold collar workers, the knowledge workers, the silver collar workers. Actually, these are the silver hair workers. Yeah. And lastly, even the no collar workers, workers who are on contract, who are casual workers, who have no permanent employment. So, in other words, we try to be as inclusive as we are, because it's only that way that we can we can continue to remain relevant. Secondly, we are also a labour movement for all ages of Singaporean. Uh, all ages means young and old. And thirdly, all nationalities. So 80% of our union members are Singaporean, 20% are non-Singaporean. Mm. So we bring them to the labour movement as well. So this all colour C, all ages A, all nationality N. So what it stands for? All can. Yeah. <laughs> C A N. So basically we say look, all workers can be part of the labour movement. And I think that's how that's how we we, we remain uh, relevant. Uh, but that's not to say that uh, we don't have uh, challenges. Uh, uh, I just mentioned two. One is the ageing of our workforce, the uh, ageing of our population. It's of great concern to us because uh, Singapore will be among the fastest uh, ageing uh, nation in the world, uh, basically because uh, our population, uh, we went through the uh, baby boomer period. Uh, our, sing our, our population is well-educated. Uh, and one, one consequence of uh, having a well-educated population it's that either they don't get married, or they marry too late, or they have only one or two children. So as a result, our total fertility rate is only 1.29, among the lowest in the world. And as a result, our population is aging quite fast. And as a result, we are adopting open door to bring more people to come in, foreign manpower to become a PR, to become a citizen, so that we can continue to grow. Now, so the aging of our workforce is a concern. And so what we are, the labour movement is doing now is how do we remain relevant to our workers for life. Yeah. So as they finish their employment, then they're going to re-employment. A re-employment law will come into place in Singapore 2012, where workers upon retirement, they're encouraged to continue working, not necessarily the same job, not necessarily the same pay, but continue to remain uh, productive. Yeah, so, how do we, so there's one area where we try to continue to be relevant, not just to the young, but also to the old. The second is uh, the professional workers, the gold collar workers. Again, as we become a, uh, we're going to promote more technology development, innovation development, market development. Uh, we're going to uh, move from value added to high value added to value create. Uh, now the next buzzword is value multiply. Mm. Yeah. So, so our economy keeps changing, you see. Yeah. So as we keep changing, how do we ensure that the tripartism will be able to keep in pace with this economic repositioning? Yeah. So I think your point is an important one, and I think we do recognise that we must remain relevant. But if I may say just a couple of words of the value multiplication, uh, there's something that the, uh, I feel very excited about, uh, is that the, uh, over time, uh, we're seeing more and more companies looking to Asia uh, as a platform for them to try something new. Try something new, not for the Singapore market, because they're way too small, but really try something new in Singapore, and from there, use Singapore as a platform to go into Asia and to the rest of the world. Uh, so, for example, uh, one company uh, is a multinational company, uh, Scandinavia based. Yeah. So, when he heard about our CBA being cheaper, better, and faster, so he came to see me. Yeah. He said, Look, I'm very excited about the CBF. I said, Why are you so excited about the CBF? He said that the, this company, they have a manufacturing plant all over the world. Yeah. And they are now looking ahead in the next 10 years. And they're looking to set up the factory of the future. They needed to set up two. They said, at this moment, I can handle two. Now, two locations to set up the factory of the future to make sure that they will work. Mm. Then from there, they'll multiply them. Yeah. And they've decided that Germany, I don't know why, I didn't ask him that they are still busy. So they've decided on Germany as one of the two locations. I said, what about the second location? Have you decided? He said, no, not yet. I said, is Singapore in the running? He said, Singapore was not in the running until I heard of the CBF. <laughs> yeah, cheaper, better, and faster. So now this company is now talking to the EDB and, and with our agency. We're now actively engaging this company 
to see how can we uh, use Singapore as a platform for them to build the factory of the future here so that Singapore, together with Germany, hopefully will become the value multiplier uh, for this company. And I think increasingly, this will be the kind of direction that we'll be taking. Singapore cannot be as big as China. No way, eh? yeah, in terms of size and whatever. Uh, we will always be small. Yeah. So we cannot compete on quantity. Yeah. But what we can make up for is through quality. And we believe that value multiplication uh, is the way to go. Uh, uh, it's one of the ways to go for Singapore. Yeah. Minister, um, every time we need, meet uh, senior members of government like yourself, we're reminded in a very obvious way why it is that Singapore has been as successful it is, as it has over the last several decades. Thank you very much for those very insightful, thoughtful, and transparent comments on this occasion. Minister, thank you very much. Thank you very much. much. Thank you.